I'm watching Sue Peters Hawke here um, direct this panel, and it's magnificent. <laughs> She's good at this stuff. Sit down, Sue. <laughs> Sit down, everyone. Thank you. Um, look, can I just address one particular issue? I know the, um, the suggestion and allegation of bias is so often thrown at the ABC and ABC presenters. Um, and I just thought among, in this room today I should actually make a declaration where, um, well, it's true. I am biased. I am. I have preferred groups of people. And these people who have sat in the front row here this morning are my favourite group of people. Can you please give them a big round of applause? Stand up, everyone who came and sit in the front row. These, these are my people. <laughs> so I am biased, so take that. Um, thanks for coming back, everyone. I love this crowd. You are on time, you are connected, you are focused, you're engaged. We're going to have a lovely few days. Um, before I introduce this next session, though, which is going to be tremendous, please take your phones out. There'll be live polling with the audience, and you can also submit questions for the panel. Did you know that, Sue? Yes. Okay. Uh, you'll see them up here on the screen. So they'll come up here on your fold back, and you'll see them as you want to. Ask them to the panel uh, or, you know, ignore them. I didn't say that. Um, now, our discussion today is called a Community Response to Dying. All communities have people who are approaching the end of their life. So in this session, we'll learn how communities can become better at supporting people through this time and look after people who are grieving the death of a loved one. So you've got experts who are sharing their experiences of using the arts, training and education to improve the death literacy of their community. Leading this wonderful panel through this discussion is the irreplaceable Sue peters Hawk. She also doesn't need much of an introduction. She's the National Ambassador for Alzheimer's Australia and the co-chair of the Federal Dementia Forum. She's the daughter of two of the greatest people this country's ever produced, Mr Bob Hawke and Ms Hazel Hawke, who we all love still. Um, she's very best known now for her expertise and passion in the areas of dementia, positive ageing, care and community. And she's your facilitator now. Please welcome up to the stage Sue peters Hawke. Thanks, Virginia. Thanks, everybody. We thought we'd better do one come up just for a bit of drama, but seven was a bit many, so that's our compromise. Um, so, yeah, this is about all communities have people who are dying, and we have a superb selection of people who... Aren't who, dying. Who, right now, aren't dying. Someday will, like all of us. Um, but who intersect and work very directly with people who are dying and the people who care with and for them. So have, each have unique and very experienced points of view to offer. So what I'm going to do, you know things that have long bios are really, really tedious. If you want their full bios, you can look in the conference notes or they're probably on the app or whatever. I'm just going to thumbnail each of these people for you before each of them says a little bit about what particular concerns or passions or questions they want to bring to this session and raise for you or share with you. We'll go through that and then we'll try and act like you're all not here on one level and just have a dinner party conversation. I'd encourage all of you to talk to each other. And we'll be watching for any questions that come up and we'll just sort of dance with chaos and see how we go okay. with it all. Okay? And then if we have time, I'll ask each of these people to make a closing statement. So we're going to start with Professor Ken Hillman. And Ken is a Professor of Intensive Care at Liverpool Hospital uh, and works clinically in palliative care and with people who are dying and with their families and loved ones, yes? And you do a lot else besides, but I'll leave it to you to, as to what of that you want to share with us, if you'd like to go ahead, Ken. Thank you very much, Sue. Um, intensive care is where I've worked. I've been working full-time in intensive care since about 1980, and I've seen this incredible change. When I first started, there were young people who we could theoretically potentially make better serious infections, trauma, and things like that. And then gradually over the time, they've become older, 
They've got multiple diseases, not a single problem. Most of them are over the age of 70, and many of them are in the last few days or weeks of life. How did this happen? There are many, many reasons which I won't go into, but it has happened. And our acute hospitals now have mainly elderly, frail people with multiple problems, and they're the people in my intensive care unit. There's hardly a ward round goes by where one of us doesn't say, please don't ever let this happen to me. So it's extraordinary that we're doing it to other people. And that's a very complex mm. sort of business, this sort of conveyor belt. You get sick in the community, even if you're 100 years of age, people get worried about you, call the ambulance, ambulance takes you to the emergency department, they package you because that's what they do, they bring you into hospital. And then one of my colleagues rings me and says, Ken, I've got a 95 year old, but he's a very good 95 year old, they're always very good 95 year olds. <laughs> and I've had a chat to the relatives and they want everything done. And that's a real cop out. And it, leaves us with enormous problems in that then we're often the ones who have to withdraw and withhold treatment and to have this conversation. So that's why I'm here basically, it, it, you know, that, that we all need to have this conversation and we certainly need to have it a long time before I see them. So I, I'm sort of interested in how we get to them sooner. Now, because I only work in a hospital, I can only do my work there but I know that the real answer is in the community. But we, we've, uh, we've developed a tool in the last three or four years which we think is probably the most accurate tool to, to sort of define the prognosis in the elderly frail people. Now, there's uncertainty, just like there's uncertainty in everything in medicine, but it's reasonably accurate. It's a flag, so we can now have the response. And the response is, one, an honest and empathetic discussion, because believe it or not, most of these people are not told that they're near the end of life. And then two, to, to empower them to make choices. And then three, to make sure those choices happen while they're in the hospital and out in the community. I might stop there, Sue. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But um, a lot of food for thought. Kerry. Uh, Kerry Noonan also works at Liverpool Hospital. I know. Liverpool Hospital, very well represented here, is a clinical psychologist and also director, and I think co founder, Kerry, of the Groundswell Project, which is committed to broad based grassroots community literacy around issues of death and dying. Is that a fair summary, yeah, do you think, Kerry? It is a fair summary. Great. Right. Thank you, Sue. What would you like to say to us? <clears throat> well, I guess um, the other end of what Ken was talking about. One of the reasons we started the Groundswell Project is to have a creative, have a more creative conversation. So this was seven years ago we started talking in communities, doing drama projects and doing other things to try and shake things up in terms of the conversations that we were having in communities. Um, and over the past seven years, I guess, we've learnt an enormous amount and there are three things that really we've started to kind of really move into now. And one is looking at how we can take all of that learning that we've had over the last seven years and, and look at how we can innovate more in communities. And what's happening in that innovation conversation is what Jane was talking about earlier, which is the collaboration between organisations, small charities like the Groundswell Project, and larger organisations. And now health services are coming to us and asking us about how they can do compassionate communities work and community development work in their community. And we're supporting them now to do that. The other thing that we've done is we've realised, again, um, kind of on, we, we've started developing uh, the work around death literacy uh, about nine years ago when we started the research at Western Sydney University. And what we realised is that there's a possibility of developing an index and doing some social research around what death literacy is. So we've now been able to partner with Western Sydney University to look at, well, if we're going to do this work in communities and it's going to be community-based and embedded with regular people, 
how do we look at social impact? How do we look at whole of community approaches? And, um, and then I guess the other, part of our, the other part of our learning has really been about developing the arts and developing work in communities with people. So, so yeah, I'm really passionate. I guess for me, having a clinical role as a clinical psych in a ward and seeing the downstream effect of people not talking about, not addressing, not, not actually even have, having the conversation of, well, when, when there was a time that you couldn't care for yourself, where did you want to be? What did you want to do? What, what were the conversations that you had? Um, those conversations, it's too late to have them with us in the acute palliative care it's ward at Liverpool Hospital. So, so we want to go way upstream. We want people to be having these conversations as young people in, in schools, in regular normal places. We go beyond, we want to go beyond normalising into socialising, socialising the conversations around death and dying. So that's what I'm passionate about. That sounds great. Sounds like it'll make Ken's job a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> And now we come to Molly. Before we get into relating each other's points to each other, we have Molly Carlisle with us. And Molly, well, Molly's, you've become the death talker, haven't you, Molly? Mm -hmm. um, and has written, in my opinion, a fabulous book about death and dying, a, a real go-to book if you want to open that subject up for yourself or anybody you know. There's plenty around. I happen to have read that one and thought it's very applicable and useful in an Australian context. Um, but Molly also was originally a nurse, I think, Molly, yes, and is now the CEO of a, a palliative care district in Melbourne. So you work very practically on the ground as well as in advocacy mm. and education. Mm. So what are the key things you'd like to share with us, given that that's the, the stretch of your experience, Molly? Um, well, I guess for me, Sue, I've been around a really long time. Um, <laughs> I've got the hair to prove it. Um, and I, I sort of feel like the, at this time, at this time where we are right now is the first time in probably 30 years of, of working in palliative care where I feel we're at a critical point. And it's, it's a point at which, it's a jump off point. There's so much starting to, it's like, you know, like a fungus. You know, a fungus sits there like that and it throws out a spore here and a spore there and a spore over there. But if you're really lucky, the spores all hook up and they make one really big fungus. And I reckon we're at that point where our spores are all getting ready to hook up. And when we're a big fungus, you just better watch out because <laughs> that's when we can... Trouble. Yes. <laughs> that's when we can affect real change. And, you know, my clinical background has been in acute hospitals and in community services and in hospices. Like, I've worked across the whole realm. I've worked as a clinician. I've worked as a manager. I, I'm now a CEO. So I see, I've seen everything from, you know, line 34 on a budget item all the way through to a distraught family by a bedside, not knowing how to say goodbye and being frightened of saying it too quick. Mm. Um, I think that the big opportunity for us here is as our communities come together is to understand that it takes everybody. And, you know, I move in very different spheres. Mm. I move in the acute sphere, I move in the aged care sphere, I move in the community development sphere. And the thing that, that worries me is that there's a potential for some finger pointing around how we got here. Forget how we got here, we're here. So the, the most important thing from my view is how do we move forward educating and nurturing our kids empowering our communities so that older people don't die in Ken's ICU or in ED um, or, or alone. alone and that families aren't put in a position where they're having to make un unfair choices at a point in their lives when they're the least able to make them. So that's me. Thanks, Molly. Leah, 
Liz, uh, GP. What are they called? What's your marketing campaign at the moment for GP? Specialists Just in life. <laughs> no, specialists in life, I think. Rebadging. But you've also written in the space. Uh, you've fictionalised, I think, um, th this issue of death and dying. And it's something that you feel very passionate about. You've written The Waiting Room and We're All Going to Die which does seem to me to be the bottom line of this conference. <laughs> Spoiler alert, yeah. And um, what would you like to share with us today, Leah? Thanks so much for inviting me. It's really exciting to be here. Um, I guess uh, about six years ago, I was putting together an anthology of doctor writers. I'm a writer as well as being a GP and always have kind of a dual, always had a dual career. And so I was putting together people like Oliver Sacks and Jerome Groupman and and came across Atul Gawanda. I was putting together this anthology, A, as a fundraiser for the Starlight Children's Foundation, but B, to take all these doctor writers on a ward round and say, what is it? You know, how do they check their emotional temperature on the page? And I was in New York at the publisher and I'd, I'd woken up, I was very nervous to go to the publisher to sort of flog the book in New York. And I just had this lightning bolt realisation that I'm actually scared of dying and you're probably sitting there going mm, so what that's kind of a lot of people but I just read Atul Gawanda's beautiful essay Letting Go which he based Being Mortal his wonderful book on and it struck me that I've been in the profession for a long long time um, but it's never I've never unpacked the fact that I'm scared of dying mm. so you know we had I, I trained at Monash University and we had a whole sex week as medical students. And you know, we, you know, the teacher, the tutor walked in and blackboard, chalk, shows my age, on one side penis, on the other side vagina, and we had to list how many different euphemisms and names we could give for each of that. But did anyone in our entire training or subsequent to that talk to us about death and dying? I I'm, I'm, was quite horrified to say no. So I found myself in a position where I was kind of the pizza chef that was scared of the dough. Um, and that really galvanised me to kind of put myself on the, on the dissection board, pin myself down as a writer and as a GP who's, what, what's the thing? Who's specialist your, in specialist life. In life. Well, I wanted to see how could we also be your specialist in death because, you know, in, in the medical profession, and I've said it over and over again, it's been a bit misinterpreted, but death equals failure. I don't condone that, but that, I think that's the flag that we've either had thrust into our hands or have sort of gone off with. I don't know how much is supply and demand, and I think our profession in particular needs to have these conversations that you're having today. And, thank, and I wrote, um, we're all gonna die, spoiler alert, um, pretty much, um, it's a bit of a memoir, it's, it's my experiences, it's, it's woven with a lot of my patients' experiences, and then it's a road trip. It's a road trip to put myself, to, to confront myself so that I didn't walk into sports school anymore with my two daughters, and when they went and picked up the, the scarf with the skulls on it, go, oh no, 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 have the little butterflies. Um, <laughs> I walked, the first thing I did when I came home was walked into my local cemetery and I had never been to a cemetery after my parents had died and walked around and had quite a nice time looking at the graves, Sir John Monash and Albert Tucker and then met um, the curator who was uh, trellising roses around the cremation plaques and, and introduced myself and I said, hi, I'm, I'm Leah and he wiped his hands and he goes, oh, g'day, I'm Ash. <laughs> <laughs> True story. So that was the start of what, what I call a, a joyful, jo it's a joyful book about death. It really um, helped me, kind of, anyway, I'll shut up. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. <laughs> Look at all the wonderful different perspectives we're bringing to this. This is fabulous. Libby, our next guest is Libby Maloney. And uh, just uh, fingernailing your bio, Libby. Uh, Libby's a founder of Natural Grace Holistic Funerals. And which is an independent, holistic, and environmentally sensitive, and part of the movement towards personalisation, I think, of and owning of death, and independent, like celebration of it that doesn't just go to a cookie cutter sort of model. Is that Correct. a fair way of saying what you're on about? Absolutely. And which involves working in and building in the community, and um, 
again, normalising, socialising death um, from her perspective. I've heard her speak before and a lot of fabulous stories. I don't know what she's going to choose to tell us today, but I'll leave that to her. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Um, I feel... On, on one hand, really dumb when I sit in these settings. Um, I come from no medical background whatsoever. Um, I'm an accountant by profession earlier to, to seeing the light and, and living uh, alongside um, death. But on the other hand, I feel really fancy. And the reason I feel really fancy is because um, I think I'm, I'm privileged. And people get all thinking about that word, but it is a privilege and I'm deeply honoured um, to be trusted uh, in my community and communities all across Victoria to be part of the network of people who are doing exactly what we're all talking about. Yes. So um, the people that are at the very centre of the networks that I work in are the people who aren't coming to your ICU, Ken. Um, and that makes me feel really fancy. <laughs> um, I passionately believe that, um, that the most efficient and uh, effective way of getting to this dream that we're all, seems to be on the same path that we're agreeing about, is about community development. Um, if you develop individual communities and individuals, literally down to one single person at a time, to understand, to be brave in the face of death, to stand at kitchen tables and, and kitchen benches and around dinner tables and say, I know something about this. Would you like to talk about it? Um, I think that is, is the key and that's how what I dedicate um, my many hats that I wear uh, between um, It Takes a Village Compassionate Communities, which we um, uh, just uh, the, the gospel of, of the Groundswell Project and, and Compassionate Community Movement. Um, we, we practice that and we live by that every day. Um, I'm also a co founding a member of the Natural Death Advocacy Network, which is really about empowering choice around um, at end of life and then my, my work at Natural Grace. And, and the beauty of all those different things is, is I never mind which hat I'm wearing and um, because it's all just me, it's all just the people that I'm so blessed. We have so much fun. Yeah. Um, we have so much fun. And, um, and to be able to contribute in just a small way yeah. in that community development role it's funny, um, I would say as a funeral director that I would refer maybe two or three people a week to palliative care. Yep. So there's this sort of thing, it's a little bit like Virginia was saying this morning, um, the commercialisation of death is kind of okay. Like people go, okay, you've got a diagnosis or you're ageing, um, you better get your funeral plan organised. Um, never prepay a funeral and if you take out funeral insurance, <laughs> I'll hunt you down. <laughs> um, but um, uh, don't prepay a funeral either. It's just... Dumb. Just put money in a, in a bank account. Um, but um, <laughs> I'll find me later and I'll fill well, you in on that. We might unpack. Maybe not. But, um, <laughs> but we get when when we work so closely together yes. um, and we develop the communities one by one. So I come from the Macedon Ranges in Central Victoria. Our population is about forty five thousand. Of that ten percent, which is four and a half, nearly five thousand people are trained in mental health first aid. Now, that's a purely an example of how community development can work. We've set a goal of 2020, so 20% of our population will be trained in mental health first aid. Now, we're, we're country folk. It's really small country towns, um, but it's taken hold yes. by good leadership, and that's a really good example. And I think we can learn from that across yeah, into the helps. space that we're talking about. So, thank you. Great. Thanks, Libby. Our last guest is Margaret, Margaret Ambridge, who is both a, so a physiotherapist, I know this, and then I haven't got my glasses on, so I have to go like this to check that I've remembered correctly. <laughs> Margaret's a physiotherapist, but also an acclaimed um, and nationally exhibited artist. Uh, so she's got a lot of considerations in this space, and lately she's um, brought these together and done and made a film which we cannot show in its entirety but she's talked to people who have different facets and aspects of experience in working with people who are dying and we're going to just go to a small teaser on that film now. If, do you want to say anything before we do that, Margaret, or just go to the film? I'd probably prefer not to, <laughs> but no, I will. <laughs> um, so yes, I'm here today as an artist. 
Um, but I, I'm a physio, I work at Mobbury Hospital in the palliative care unit um, at the cold face. And a couple of years ago, I saw a chance to have an, a, um, an art exhibition to allow the community to see through my eyes and see what I see at the, at the bedside. And I thought it might give the community another vehicle in just to see what palliative care is like and what it's like working in that space. Fabulous. So, yeah. Thanks for that. Can we throw now to that, the teaser? For, and I believe that you can see Margaret's video in... So can I just speak to that really quickly? Before yeah. We just really in quickly? the exhibition space, I think, yes? Yeah. Oh, no, I just want to about the teaser. So, right. So I... And I'll be very quick. But many, many years ago, I had a, a patient who was dying who... And I was only 21 in a cardiac ward after bypass. And... I ran out of things to offer as a physio. I could not clear these lungs. Um, and I just stood there at the end of the bed and said, I, I can't make your bed. I have nothing more I can do. And he looked at me and said, well, could you peel me that orange? And I, I said, yes. So for the next five days, I went in and peeled this, this man an orange until he died. And it's something I will never, ever forget. And so this teaser and the, the uh, little movie you're about to see is about... 10 colleagues that I interviewed and the people that they will never forget and why. And I'm sure all, everyone here has their own list of people or a few people that you will never, ever forget. And it's a connection with those and trying to give the community a, a view of our side of, as workers. So, that's fantastic. So that's Thank what you. it's about. So. That, that sets it's, it up much better. Thank you for doing of, that. Of yes. So. so now we actually will throw to that video. <laughs> I believe. Under the radar? You have to, people have to touch you because you can't be of use otherwise. And I don't believe that inherently it's dangerous or damaging for us to get so close to people who are at such difficult times in their lives. But I jumped on the bed and I pulled her forward just to sort of bring her upright. And her, she just came forward and she put her head on my shoulder and she died. And that really rocked my world. And the girlfriend had looked at the doctor and said, oh, here comes the magic man. So, of course, the doctor's face just completely dropped. And it was an image that I'll never forget was the way it affected him was because he was so young and that he was going in with bad news. Thank you. I think, uh, so I'd urge you all to take the opportunity. I think somewhere in the program it says how you can see it, but also in the exhibition hall you'll be able to actually see it or find out how to look at it online. Uh, and I think what that does is point us to that deep personal experience of death, which is, in a sense, part of what we're all dealing with here and how do we contextualise that properly medically and how can we serve that medically and where is that maybe not going so well medically or whatever. And um, I just share my experience of... I've always been interested in this whole thing about re realising that we're scared of dying, that we live in a society that doesn't prepare us well to talk about it and I've informally studied Tibetan Buddhism for many years and... Uh, I remember when I first started reading that stuff, people would say, oh, that's morbid. And I realised it was actually the opposite of morbid, that in confronting the unconfrontable, it might not make you not scared, but it started to open things up. And I had an amazing experience personally when my mum died. And unusually for aged care, she was in a place where really good palliative care was integrated into their care capacity. So she we were asked, oh, do you want to take her to hospital? And it was, no, why would we do that? Um, they had the capacity there. And so for nine days, we as her family were able to sit with her and um, dementia specialist nurse and every couple of days a, a, a doctor who was a, a pal care specialist who was connected to the campus would come by and we knew they were available at the end of the phone if needed and that PRN stuff could be written up if... Po so we, we knew that the medical expertise was there in the background, but our experience was 
of personally with being with mum through the end of her life. And I'll talk in the other session that I'm talking about how people with dementia are present till the, the moment they leave, unlike some of the stereotypes we unfortunately deal with. And we experienced that with mum. We were there with her and she swung to look at our voices and we got takeaway meals and a bottle of wine each <laughs> night and then my sister would sleep over and me and my kids would go home and then come back the next day. And it was a precious, precious, precious experience. And what I took out of that and what I think is one of the themes and one of the drivers for many of us at this conference is that, and it came up in a conversation I had with my kids after that, we were reflecting on it all and they were both in their 20s and had never really thought about or dealt with death much. And I said, yeah, you learnt, didn't you, that death might be sad, but it doesn't have to be bad. Mm. And I think what we're on about is we can't take the grief out of... We're not about putting on rose-coloured glasses about dying, but there is so much unnecessary suffering that goes on from questionable medical interventions, from being unprepared for loss, from being unprepared for decision makings and making them at times of high distress, from not knowing our choices, from all the sorts of things that are going to come up in the sessions, and that we all see an enormous potential to reduce unnecessary suffering. Can I just respond to that, Sue? Please. I think in, in my experience, the, the people who are supporting the dying person, if, if they're not prepared for what's going to happen next, yes. then they take away from that experience a, a, a personal uh, view of death that will never be changed. Now, the person in the bed may well have been very comfortable Yes, they might have been, their chest might have been rattling a bit or, or something, but from a medical perspective, they were, they were being comfortably managed. But because the people around the bed hadn't had explained to them, this is normal, and now, you know, mum's feet are going to go blue because her circula peripheral circulation's shutting down, so watch for that. And, you know, if people know that stuff, yes. then they go, Oh, we just noticed this has just happened. So that means the next thing that's probably going to yes. happen is this. Yes. And so they're engaged, they're empowered, and something doesn't occur. Well, there's no guarantee, but by and large, things shouldn't occur that freak people out and scar them for the rest of their days. Yes. Mm. So it's about preparation yes. for what, what accompanying someone you love while they die, may sound like, look mm. like, smell like, mm. feel like. Mm. Mm. Can, I, can I add to that too? Because <coughs> I think one of the things that we're learning from the work that's happening overseas and also some of the, the community development work that's happening here in Australia is that, that that education, that support doesn't have to... And, well, firstly, it doesn't come from health professionals. It usually happens informally between people. People find their own connections and networks. They find the mate that's already done this for their mum, and they go and speak to them. They're onto the phone, on the phone to them and texting them and getting reassurance. That health professionals have a role in this kind of um, support, but not probably the, the bigger role that we think we have we actually have a smaller role. And so rethinking the way that we engage with communities means thinking about that we, there is an army of people out there who have cared for people who have died. There is, there, I think once we, once we start to look at um, death literacy in our population next year and get some numbers and understanding, I think we'll be really surprised by the amount of death literacy, actually, that is in communities. And I think it'll be related to the fact, and some of our research has already shown, mm -hmm. that's related to the fact that they've already cared, they've already done those things, they've had that experience that you've just talked about, they've been able to reflect on it. But we can do that informally. So when we're thinking as service providers, we need to rethink that top-down approach that we often have, which is educate, educate, educate the people, um, and think about going in at, at the grassroots. 
and finding out what our communities already know. Because we might find out, actually, that our communities already know about advanced care planning, but there are some myths and some other things that they might have about it, or there's some myths about ICU or palliative care that they have, and that's where mm. health professionals can intervene. We don't need to do the, the big kind of top-down heavy education. We need to find out what our communities know. That's what we don't know. That's what we haven't done really in this country is really deeply connected with the people outside of our doors. Look at the literacy that's there. Yes. I think, I think you raised some really important points and I'm, I'm honoured to be a dying to know ambassador too and I think you do incredible work. But I think the disconnect is really important mm. that, you know, death is a bestseller in the box office, you know, mm -hmm. isn't Game of Thrones, I've never watched it, but, you know, I hear my son kind of talking about mm. that everything, death is kind of sterilised in society, but real death happens off stage a lot of the time. Um, you know, when we were medical students, it was down in the morgue and, and the nurses tidied up. You never, I, I rarely saw dead bodies. But I think what I'm banging on about, um, and, as, and this is why I've written this book too, is that death is from womb to tomb. Yes. So you can even talk about miscarriage. Why is there such a stigma and a silence around the fact that you don't tell anyone until you're three months pregnant? <gasps> because, oh my God, you know, you might lose the baby. Well, why? What's so bad about that? So I think if we look at it across the board, we're having conversations about end of life care, yes, and in the elderly, and we're talking about possibility of voluntary euthanasia, but I think this is the tip of the iceberg because we're a death denying society. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's what needs to be Opening shaken up. up. The death literacy has to be across the board. And yes, it's mm. not just my profession, but my profession certainly can mm. play a role in it, and as we all can. Mm. But I think it's, it's society at large that will not discuss dead. Mm. And ev it's even embedded linguistically, you know, I'm dying for a cup of tea and I'm dying for a pee and I'd kill for a, you know, a, a sandwich. <laughs> but he passed and he went to a better place. And she's taking a dirt nap. I mean, <laughs> I haven't heard that, haven't one. Heard that a one. A dirt nap. <laughs> good one. I know. I, I know when we before. were choosing. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I know when we were choosing aged care <laughs> for mum. The only place, and we decided we liked this place best anyhow. But one of the things we asked all of them was how, how most of the people who come to you die, and uh, how do you deal with that? And this was the only place that didn't start to squirm and look uncomfortable and didn't start using euphemisms. They had a conversation with us about, yes, dying, and how they were in the process of onboarding palliative care. And that and the experience I referred to earlier, plus the point you're making, Kerry, made me realise that there is enormous literacy and if you're in a position where somebody close to you is dying or perhaps it's yourself dying or you're working with somebody who's dying, there's an amazing network of people. Like I asked some retired nurses whose research specialty had been dying with dementia before anybody ever talked about it. And I said, what are some of the specific characteristics? So if you have somebody who's dying of a particular type of cancer, it might be good to know some of the specifics of the sorts of things that might happen then. I know from my Buddhist experience, I'd, had, I'd listened to teachings on how... Dying can seem a bit like hard work, you know, how the breathing get, you know, you were saying how... And, and so I was able to share that with my kids and the rest of my family when mum was rasping and, they, what's wrong? It's just, the body takes a while to break down. And so, yeah, so we could have conversations and then we could be supported by care workers, by specialists... We made some custard, which was the last thing she ate, and then we did the swabbing, the mouth comfort stuff. There's the potential to be included. And then after Mum died, we sat and had a cup of tea with her and did a champagne toast and swabbed her with champagne. That was the last thing she ever had. So I think there's ways when we bring all this knowledge and but this literacy and create comfort. I yes. We, we've all experienced, I think yes. kids are so honest when it comes to death and dying, and if you can have yes. an honest conversation. I mean, the Include talks them. about the best way to talk about death to kids is buy a goldfish. Wait. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> God invented them for, isn't it? <laughs> Small creatures. You think that's good advice? Well, cause they, yes, because they don't bring that sort of baggage, and if you can <laughs> encourage them from an early age not to carry yeah. that sort of... Or in our case, a guinea pig and a new puppy. <gasps> I'll leave that yeah. with you. Well, hermit crabs. <laughs> hermit crabs are a con. 
<laughs> yep. Can but I it, add something? Yes, there? please. Um, just, That's what you're all here for. <laughs> just linking into everything that, that you've said, Molly and, and Kerry and Leah, is um, how imperative is to integrate the after death and experience mm, as well. Yeah. Mm. Some of the, the most positive um, things we see from, from families are when they've been included, um, that, that when mums died in, in an aged care setting, which yeah. you're referring to, um, that, that, that a guard of honour's been formed at the door. <gasps> That, that mum's gone out the front so door, much. that they've yes. wrapped mum up and put her on the trolley. Yes. That they've then escorted yes. her out of the facility. There's a, there's, it's a really important aspect of it and communities know about it. There's an honouring that happened. I never would have thought of it, but yeah. when people from the home who'd been in mum's life yeah. did that, I, I just... Yeah, I know. Compared to... It was amazing. ...taken out the back by the laundry chute. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that happens in mostly. In bag. Mostly. And this business of closing doors, I think if, if the aged care people in the room um, surveyed their residents, they know that they're going to die. Mm. They're not afraid of it. And, um, and my call to action for the day would be to allow um, your <laughs> families, if they want to, to hold the funerals in your settings. Because that's become the person's home. And the only people that can come are the friends that have come from the setting. And if you go and hold it, as my mother would say, in St Jack and the Lifeboat, blah, 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 in a town down the road, none of the people that are their friends can come. Mm. So if you are willing to really push, push mm. the barriers, yes. really integrate. Yeah. Palliative care is exquisite in this country. It really is. And mm. But not widely not enough available. And moving it through. And when it's been done really well, we yeah. can follow that all the way through, and that has beautiful bereavement outcomes. There's, yes. a, there's a little gap, I think, between um, the beautiful care and the amazing work that palliative care does. We, we care for people right up until they die, and then we hand them over somewhere else. And we're not even allowed in some of our hospitals to recommend funeral directors. We're not allowed to... We're not. There's some policies that actually prevent us um, from... No, um, referring people to good care or, or doing um, the thing in between because then we pick up in bereavement. So it's like um, at the moment we actually skip a whole important point which is death care, which mm. we have cared for our dead for you know, our whole history as humans, except for at the moment. We don't, we don't not, no, not in all cases. No, no. I, I, I don't yeah. want to. You're getting better. No, no, it. but I, so I something just want to add camp in the fact that it's all, I guess we're all making um, generalisations about, about things. After death care should happen where the death happens. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it does and very well, and other times it doesn't. So um, with, with a nursing hat on, I would say if I looked after a client and they died on my watch, they wouldn't be going anywhere until I'd washed them, I'd dressed them, I'd supported the family if they wanted to be involved in that, and that was 20 years ago. So I think we may have lost that a little yeah. bit and we need to bring back the fact that palliative care goes from the point the person enters the system until we hand them over to the care of the funeral director. Except yeah, I, death ex care happens in the community, Molly. In oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In people's yes, homes, I, yes, in I funeral know, directors. What we have at the moment is people, people who kind of have a gut feeling that they'd like to care for their dead because they've done all this caring and they don't have access to, to after the person has gone from palliative care, to be able to have a visual at home. And we need more example. of a continuum. So they should be that's allowed to take their person home, is well, this what and, you mean? And legally they can, yes. and that's part of death literacy. Part of death literacy mm. is that know-how that you have about the death system and being able to understand your choices at mm. all these points along these silos that kind of exist. Yes. Mm. So we have all these points and we know what to do at each of them. And so if people want to take their dead home out of the hospital to their home and have a vigil, because that's their gut feeling and they want to do that, we ought to be able to facilitate yeah, that and go. Or, yeah, or I have if, no argument with if that people have died outside the home, like in mum's case, we spent three or four hours with her before 
um, the funeral people we'd chosen came to take her away. Well, she was going, she was donating some stuff, so she had to go by the hospital. Um, she went to the hospital after she died, not before. <laughs> but that, that three or four hours was very, very important. If you're looking at this, con this continuum of experience yeah. from the recognition of perhaps the onset of the dying process through that process, which is a whole process, the, the time around actual death and then the time after, and then whatever celebration or marking or grieving there is. We're, we're looking at this process, which has so much fact and physiology, but so much emotion to it. We're dealing with all of that. But I want to come back to you, Ken. We've, uh, we women have been out talking you. And I want to... Uh, it's interesting, because you said 20 years ago as a nurse, you would have washed and, mm. and included the family. And that seems to coincide a little bit with this timeline of us, in a sense, shoving death to ICU um, or um, not dealing with questions well in terms of who's in ICU and what for, that you opened us with. Do you want to, in light of everything that's been said, say some more, Ken, about yeah, yeah. what uh, might help? Yeah, sure. Well, <clears throat> one, one, of, one, of the, one of the other sort of pornographic things, apart from death and dying, is ageing. And most people who die are... The older, you know... Statistically you know, the speaking, older, the it's older. the highest risk, yes. And most people who die in hospitals are elderly. And it's natural, normal, expected. And so, I, I'm, I mean, I'm really interested in this group. I, I don't know so much about, so, you know, cancer, motor neuron disease and, and children, but, but it's the elderly. And ageing is also pornographic. And we need to talk about ageing. Mm. And... There's this, there's this wonderful word called apoptosis, and it means at the time of conception, every, every single death of every single cell and tissue in your body is determined. And you know how some people at 90 look like they're 60, and some people at 60 look like they're <clears throat> 90. <laughs> and it's all because of this apoptosis. It's in all of you at this very moment, exactly when, when your hair's going to go gray, when your skin's going to go a bit limp, when your muscles are going to get weak, when your bones are going to become frail, et cetera, et cetera. It's more malleable than that concept. With it, it, it but we can is, have that conversation another time. It, <laughs> yes, it is. But, if, if, you know, if, if you work backwards from death and dying, ageing, there's a million ways of preventing and stopping ageing, 99% of which are snake oil stuff. And, 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 you, know, and, and you know, I think that merges with this ageing death and dying. And there's this concept ca called frailty, which I'm really into at the moment. It's been, it's been around for a long time w with the sort of geriatricians, but we, we, can, we can actually measure this. And it's the greatest predictor of mortality. And so we're, you know, like, like in the work we're doing now, we, we've, we've, got, we've got this really easy way of measuring frailty. And the, the elderly frail have a terminal disease. And it wasn't until about six months ago that we used this word terminal. Um, if it was a 20-year-old person with a brain tumour that you couldn't do anything about, you'd say, this is terminal and we need to start talking. And we need to start talking about the elderly frail. We've now got good data, just like we have with a 20-year-old with a brain tumour, of approximately how long they've got to live. And while we need to go way back, I know that, but it's, it's a good place to start with all these elderly frail people. And so someone here said that they know it. Most elderly frail people know that they're coming to the end. The, the second people to know are the carers, the third are the nursing, and the last to know are the doctors. And we don't, we don't talk to these people as if they've got sort of a terminal condition. Ken, what a, from the point of view of being embedded in the system, we're, in a sense, to a degree, the idealists talking about change, but in there at the coalface, what are one or two key changes that you see could be made in terms of policy or behaviour or whatever that would improve people's experiences? OK, well, well, I t well, I'll tell you one that we shouldn't go along the lines of, and that is to educate every doctor and change the medical education and stuff like that. They, that may work in 10 to 20 years' time, but these people are programmed to cure you. They're not people who are going to be honest with you about the fact you haven't got long to live. So one, th one thing 
one thing I think we should do and one thing that we're doing is that we've got three specifically trained nursing staff who know how to talk and to use the D word, who know how to be compassionate but talk about dying. So we've bypassed the whole system. Mm -hmm. So as soon as we flag the elderly frail pe person as not having long to live, we bypass the home team, the admitting team, and we bring in these three superb people who know how to conduct this conversation. With, with the patient and with the patient's family? Yes, with both. Right. I'm going to I'm going to have a bit of a screaming match with you now because I think that's a cop out for our profession. I agree that that's important that there are other people and it is team effort, but I think doctors need to have these conversations. They have to be trained at medical school. Sorry, not buying it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Love yes. you Ken, but not. I, I know I know the theory and and, and it would, you, you know like, like it will happen. Yours is the emergency bypass in the meantime. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not going to happen maybe in my lifetime, but it's not going to happen within a few years because... As well, you, it as could. You, as you, as you, as I think you it's said, already happening. You know, like, like as you said yourself, Leah, that nobody talked to you about dying in your medical school, and, th and that's what there is at the moment. So it's going to take time. But in the meantime, we, we've got the problem, and this is just one of the answers. Mm. Is, I was just going to say, there's an, adi there's an additional... Um, layer that, that has an impact here and, and you know, running a community palliative care service that covers two and a half thousand square kilometres and is, is manned by an interdisciplinary team, the biggest thing that, that makes it difficult for our staff, including our palliative care physician, is that a lot of GPs just do not want to have anything to do with palliative care patients. They don't. Some patients they might have looked after for 20 years right. and as soon as they have a terminal diagnosis, they say, sorry, we're not looking after this person anymore. Right. You'll have to find a new GP. So you can imagine, we, we're lucky. We've got two nurse practitioners. We've got a palliative care physician. However, we need every client dying at home needs a GP on the ground. So that and that's a real you. problem. And I, I don't I agree with Ken, it's a long-term fix. It's, it's not something that's going to be fixed bang. Um, but we could but we agitate need to for starting do something now. Yes. about that yeah. because it just leaves people high and dry. Yeah. There's a project, a project in the UK that, that asked GPs to identify their 10 most frail people. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's where community development work was focused on. Mm -hmm. And that's had massive outcomes in terms right. of hospitalizations, dying in place of care and so on. So, so I think there are other ways of kind of also combining the knowledge that we have from institutions to really community-based development work, not community care, not um, as such, but but how we do, um, how we engage with people on the ground. And looking to where there have been innovate, innovative examples that have yeah. produced results. So we've got, we know that identifying, and then GPs kind of go, oh, phew, someone's doing something about that mob. Um, I can keep identifying them. I can keep right. looking at They're them because someone is doing it. something about it. Right. You wanted to say something, uh, Libby, I think. Uh, I just think um, there's, it's nearly a moral imperative for the GP because the... All the work that we can do, and, um, and, and, and for anybody really that wears um, the palliative care hat in a medical role, mm -hmm. um, we can sit in community and we can do everything we can, right? I mean, you name it, it's all beautiful. But if you raise your eyebrow in the wrong way, mm. if you dismiss something that that family has brought to you, in, as the doctor in particular, but also palliative care nurses mm. um, and, and physicians, everyone, you'll undo it like that. Right. So we can invest money, we can invest not enough money, we can do this, we can work. There's 800 of us here talking about it. But Ken, if you raise your eye in the wrong way, or Leah, you do, or um, Molly, as, a, as anybody that, that has a medical component, nurse, doctor, doesn't matter. If you raise your eyebrow, you will undo that work. So if you could and raise a magic wand, Libby, at the medical profession, what would you ask of them? I would ask of the doctor, if just focusing on GPs at the moment, because when you work with really engaged ones, the difference is... Mm. Uh, mm. It, it's, it's not just immediate, it's not just now. This is the difference that people feel in five, 
five minutes, five months, five years, ten years. These people are coming back and they're saying, I had this, you know, sort of ideal picture that we're, that we're trying to paint here. Yeah. Um, and the GP is imperative to that. Yes. I think what I would do is, um, is invite every single GP individually. I'm, that's, I'm such a grassroots girl, that's why I feel pretty dumb sometimes. But anyway, one at a time and say, tell me your story. Tell me when somebody that you loved died. Tell me when your granny died or mm. whatever it is. And what happened to you and what is your biography of death in your own life? Mm. And how can we as community support you, Dr So-and-so, yes. to be able to be more literate yes. in how you express death? And I think if we treat our doctors just purely as someone that belongs in our community, yes. they're not particularly fancy or not fancy, they're just one of Particular us. Particular skill set. But yes. they need support to do that. Yes. Um, and yes. particularly in rural and regional settings yes. because they probably helped deliver that person yes. or something. You know, there's a connection that's much stronger. But it, it points to the power of narrative and art and expression and writing, doesn't it? Because, and I find in the dementia field that, that as human beings, we all ha are wired for narrative <laughs> as one of our, whether that be visual or spoken or by touch, but that that creation of story and that sharing of story. It's one of the main ways we interpret and make sense of our world and prepare for being in it and for anticipating what might happen. So this points to the power of the arts and of story and writing as one of the ways we can support and prepare and help each other. I think I learnt more about being a physician by being a writer and learning about mm. narrative and learning about you know beginning, middle and end mm. and and listening for subtext and listening for the patient's story mm -hmm. than I did through all my years in medical school and training. And I think the arts say it in such a, mm. a poignant and succinct way. I think, um, you know, I don't want the ECG being giving me the final song and the final rights goodbye in my life. What do you want? <laughs> That's for another session. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Dignity. And, and I think we're talking so much about death and, and I think the focus is, you know, crystallising and distilling what we want in death is also turning around and looking at what are our values and what do we want to embrace in life? Yes. And that's the question I ask my patients, given the time, not when they come in with an ingrown toenail, although that might be an opportunity, but what is it that they, they want in the here and now, seeing that 7% of us are probably going to die at home, what, what is it, you need to have these conversations very, very early, and art and music and literature can help with that, mm. but I really think that the, the helping professions have got a key role to play in it, and I think we, we're being caught with our pants down. Mm. I think if you want to see the best practice of it that I've seen is go and um, ask Michael, the CEO at Very Special Kids in Melbourne, if you can just hang out. They, they're using all of these, the creative, the story, community, volunteers, the GPs there are grouse. Um, everybody there are. Is, is really working about what end of life care is about. Yes. Um, and so individualised, because of course, when it's a child, yes. it's so, you know, um, when it's anybody. Heightened. Well, it is, but it's particularly heightened. And we're yes. so privileged in, in yes. our country that for a child to die it just seems like that shouldn't happen to us, but of course it does. But the um, very special kids just weave this magic of, of all the things that, that we're all talking mm. about. So, mm. um, yeah, go on. And it can ahead. be magic, can't it? I mean, can. or is that little being be a beautiful. bit too bold? It can but be my magic. experience with mum know. is that it can be magic. It can be magic <laughs> if you're connected, I yeah. think. Um, my mother-in-law died in March when, when she was in the hospital. The first person I rang was Libby Maloney. <laughs> um, my mother-in-law died in her nursing home in Frankston. We took her home from the ED. Her nursing home looked after her. And when she died, Natural Grace came and picked her, her, her up from Quite Plankston a long way from Mount and took her back to Mount Macedon <laughs> where she stayed being looked after and her mauve coffin being built until her funeral service. Mm -hmm. So when you know somebody and you can just pick up the phone and go, I need a hand, because I wasn't palliative care Molly at that point. Right. I was Molly's daughter-in-law <laughs> yeah. who was having to be palliative care yeah. Molly, but um, the, the reason for saying that is that there are 
there are connections out there. Mm. It's just about knowing how to tap into them. Yeah. And that's a, a that's, lot of the time. Yeah, that's the heart of, I think, yeah. this, of community work. That if we're going to shift our thinking as health professionals about how we how we do that, we think about networks, we think about the social approaches, we encourage people to build those networks and to build those connections within their community and to find out who has already cared in their network, who's already done it before, how can they find that out. Health professionals have an amazing role to play in that um, as well. So we're not, it's not about kind of getting, you know, it's not about forgetting about all the amazing um, value that health professionals bring to any dying or death experience, but it is, it's, it's the um, community, the family, the friends, the neighbours, the schoolmates, it, that's the 95% of the caring at end of life mm. and after death happens because they all chip in. Mm. And, um, and I, so I think, yeah, if we can, as health professionals, encourage those networks, and, you know, dying to know day, People contact us all the time saying, I want to run an event. Mm. People are massively busting to engage with palliative care services and funeral services and ICU and doctors yep. and other people. So listen out for them. I was going to say, Ken, if all of this happens so that when you have your frail elderly person come into ICU because the family says we want everything done, do you think if we had if those people had been exposed to these conversations, that then you'd have a different reality manifesting oh, in ICU? Absolutely. Yes. It's not, I mean, you know, like it's not, it's, it's, it's not always that these people yeah. want everything done. But if you're, if, you're the, if you're the doctor and you say, look, your mother's very sick, I know she's old, I know she's not well, but there's only one hope for her, and that is if we transfer her up to ICU and put her on machines, what do you think? Now, if you're the son and daughter in that situation and the conversation's put like that, you know, you'd have to be a pretty brave and seemingly uncare son to say, no, nah, no, nah, let's just let her die. So, so you can see that's that... that's false hope being offered by the doctor. Well, it? well, it's not only that. I mean, it's a, you know, like, I mean, it's a cop-out. Yes. It's a cop-out because they don't... They don't want, want to deal with... They don't want to talk about dying. And, I, you know, like, I think it's something that we're learning about... Can I just tell a quick, a quick story about, about, like about how not to do it? This is about 20 years ago, and I had a 40-year-old mother who was dying. And, and so we were about to withdraw the, the, the whole treatment the next day. I had a chat to the, to, to, the, um, to the husband, and I said, look, I think we should stop treatment. And then, um, and then I knew he had two sons, so I said, you know, have you talked to your sons about this? And he said, look, I said, I'm really uncomfortable. If I bring my sons in, would you be able to talk to them and tell them that their mother's dying? And I said, yeah, OK, I'll have a try at it. So the next morning, he, he, he was walking towards me, and I've got such a strong image of this man walking towards me, and he had two sons, about seven and nine, and they were dressed so neatly, and their hair was slicked down, but they, they could sense that something was wrong. Any, anyway, so I thought that talking about dying was being honest and straightforward. So I got the two boys, sat them down, and I showed them these CT scans of the brain. I said, here's where your mum's tumour is, and, and, and you know, but, but we can't cut that out, and we can't give chemotherapy. And these two boys were just looking at me. And the, then I'd, I'd spent some time working in Denmark and Sweden, and there was this lovely story about the angel of death for young children that die. And this angel comes within an hour of dying and takes the child's soul or whatever up and takes them to all the lovely memories that they've had in their life in, in that last one hour. So I thought, no, I, you, know, I'm, I'm, you, you know, like I'm just going to change my whole story here. So I said, look, there, there's an angel who comes along when people are dying. And this angel is going to come along in a minute to your mother. So I want you to sit down and hold your mother's hand and think about all the lovely things that you've done in your life, like all the happy memories, things where you've had a birthday party or you might have fallen over or done something silly. You'll know all these things, and they're the, they're the places that your mother's going to. So they sat down, held the mother's hand, 
and we stop the ventilation, stop the drugs. But it, it, I mean, that was a major lesson to me. And there aren't many books about how to do that in that situation. There's thousands of books about cancer and, and how to talk to people in that. And I think that we could learn by sort of narratives and stories yes. as, you know, as we've been talking about. And finding narratives with individual families, perhaps. Now, we're now in wrap-up time, so anybody who like it has got 30 seconds, and I'm going to be strict. I'll, I'll, I'll an impassioned you. plea. An impassioned plea is that we are honest about death, that it is really a socio-political movement, a groundswell movement that needs to embrace death literacy across the board, honestly, compassionately, we need to bring death back out of the hospitals, bring it back into the home as much as we practi practically can. I think we're all involved in this and we're all, you know, we've got to go out and give the message and, yeah, not the fairy tales. Libby? Oh, practice what we preach. <laughs> I agree. I think we just need to really be willing to have this conversation literally in our own families um, and then hopefully that will lead to the next one. My, my, eight, my now 11-year-old has had a funeral plan since she was eight. So, <laughs> there you no. go. <laughs> <laughs> Anything from you, Margaret? Oh, I, suppose I obviously haven't said a lot, but I think in my art it says, it says what I think. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say to everyone that's here who, looks, who chooses to look after people who are dying, look after yourselves, because yes. that's the other half of this conversation. Yes, yes, so, yeah. yes. Ken, I think you've more or less done your, done your round-up, Kerry. Uh, well, I, last passionate? Yeah, last passionate plea, I guess, is de you know, death literacy is an outcome of all of the things that we do every day in our work. Mm. When people have the experience of caring um, and they have that experience and they talk about it with another person and we sit down and we have conversations with them and they use those words that we use to mm. tell their family members and to tell their community what is happening. Thanks, Kate. Um, so, yeah, the, it, everything we do mm. is, is contributing to death literacy. Anything else you wanted to say? And about? I'll just add in that bit about care as yes, self-care. Not only for professional carers, but, but for if family carers, mm -hmm. it is a lonely, torturous job often being a primary carer for a dying person at home. We as palliative care services, we might see you for two hours a day if you're lucky. The rest of the time you're on your own unless you've got a network and not everyone has a network. We need so we need to be starting, to, starting those conversations at the football club, at the school, at, you know, at, at the neighbourhood house so that when someone next door to you is sick, everyone comes running to help and that carer isn't left to do it all on their own. Fabulous. Thank you. Well, I, and I'd like to say as somebody who actually feels the incredible privilege to have experienced a good death with my mum. And uh, I know it sounds weird, but a sense of joy in how it happened that has left me Sad that she's gone, but so grateful for all the people who contributed in so many ways to that being a sad but a meaningful and precious experience. I think we know that it's possible to do it really well, and we just want to keep plugging away, and my thanks to all of you who do. Uh, it makes so much difference to people's experiences they, as they die and to the many, many people who are impacted and left behind with whatever that experience is. Mm. So thank you very much, everybody. And with that, we wind up. And I think throw back to Virginia, don't we? Thank you, everyone, won't you? That's a marvellous conversation, thank you. And um, damn you, Ken Hillman, I was determined to get to the lunch break without sobbing this morning. So you're the one who managed to break me down. Good on you. That was a mar marvellous story. Please thank our panellists as they exit the stage. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. You can hop down. Thank you. Thanks. And um, while our panellists are leaving, we're going to get our next panellists up to the stage. Robin, Julie, would you like to make your way up here um, while I introduce you both? Just let everyone come down. And um, 
we're going to seat you in the middle of this collection of chairs. Because this is where we have our conversation with a patient and a carer in order to really, in a very realistic and practical way, talk about that connection with community. Julie Morgan's an academic at the Australian Catholic University and her work there focuses on leadership and the ethical imagination. She brings together many threads of her professional life as a, as a teacher and then in the aid and development sector and um, many other areas as well. In 2012, Julie was diagnosed with breast cancer and she was supported during her treatment in Sydney by her dear friend and housemate, Kath. Just as Julie completed treatment, Kath herself was diagnosed with lung cancer and Julie then became Kath's primary carer until her death in 2014. In 2015, Julie returned to Melbourne to continue her work at the university, but then it became apparent that her breast cancer had metastasized to her bones and her lungs. She's been cared for by Peter McCallum Cancer Service and the Melbourne City Mission Home Palliative Care Team. From time to time, she also sees a palliative care specialist at Cabrini, and she's admit, been admitted on many occasions to the local St Vincent's for symptoms.